Well, good morning, church family. Let me introduce myself to you. My name is Jason Smith. I'm the pastor here. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you. Uh, on behalf of my own father, I want to uh, give a public service announcement. All he ever wanted on Father's Day was to watch the U.S. Open. But Father's Day and all the activities kind of coincided with that. So if your father likes golf, let him watch the U.S. Open today, okay? As a gift to him, right after lunch, okay? Uh, it is good to be back with you. I have missed you. If you didn't know, I had uh, been on vacation with my family. We went to Yellowstone for a week and had an incredible time. Uh, as you can tell, my voice is a little deeper this morning, uh, wrestling with allergies, and it's also the fact that I am now the great bear hunter. So that's why my voice has dropped a few notches. Uh, anyways, I went to Alaska, uh, did some fishing and bear hunting. So I was told not to share any pictures with that, so I will spare you. Uh, excited to be back with you. Very good morning. Turn with me in your Bible to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. Daniel did an incredible job last week of kicking off our sermon series. This summer we're going to walk through uh, the life of Joseph, lessons that we can learn in Joseph's life. Uh, Genesis 37, the beginning of the story, right? We, we remember a few things we need to remember. Joseph is, is the favored son of his father, Jacob. Um, and then God begins to give Joseph revelation. Uh, he has dreams of what awaits him. But the revelation of those dreams cause further jealousy and ultimately hatred within his brothers. They are jealous of him. And they throw him in a pit and sell him into slavery. Okay, that's where we're going to pick up our story. But we remember important lessons from last week, right? It's God who exalts and God who humbles. And, and God is going to use these trials in Joseph's life. So as you hold your spot there in Genesis chapter 39, I have a question for you this morning. That is believer. Do you know that the favor of God rests upon your life? Do you know that the favor of God rests upon your life? Or do you walk around like you are the, the red-headed stepchild in God's family? The misfit, the one who drew the short straw. By the time we get to the end of our service today, I pray that you know that you are blessed and highly favored because you are in the blood of Jesus Christ. All right, listen as I read uh, Genesis 39, the first five verses of that chapter. <coughs> uh, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. And so Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house. And all that he owned, he put in his charge. It came about that from that time, he made him overseer in his house and overseer of all that he owned. That the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in his house and in his field. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, as we 
examine your word as we look with instruction upon Joseph's life, as we hear your testimony of how you interacted with Joseph, about how you brought favor and blessing upon Joseph. I pray for us here this day, for all of us who are in Christ. Maybe there are some here this morning who are not in Christ. I pray that they would hear about the favor of being in Christ that you, Father, look down upon your son. You look upon your son's blood and you view us as your own. You view us as in the favor of Christ. Father, I know that, that there are many in this room who walk around defeated and discouraged, uh, who are uncertain whether you have plans and purposes for them that are in the midst of trial and confusion and, and Father, become overwhelmed and weary because they cannot see the end. Father, I pray that through this text and these circumstances and your favor that rested upon Joseph, that each of us this morning would hear and would believe and that we would walk out different today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Joseph's brothers raise him from the pit. Not because their hearts have softened. It is with hatred that they sell him for 20 shekels of silver. His final image of his brothers is the coldness in their eyes. Joseph is bound and shoved forward in the caravan his feet raw from walking. The words are foreign, but he understands the harsh tone. He who was once the favored son in an affluent family is now a slave and barely above the animals. The bustling marketplace in Egypt is suddenly called to attention as Joseph and others are paraded for the auction. Buyers poke and prod the way that you would examine livestock. Joseph understands almost nothing, and yet he understands everything as he's shoved into the chariot of his new owner, Potiphar the captain of a special unit for Pharaoh. Potiphar is serious and stern. He is a man of importance who has worked his way up into prominence with Pharaoh. As Joseph sits quiet, staring at the dirt, make no mistake, this situation is abhorrent and unjust. See, Joseph is completely innocent. His only crimes were the special revelations which came to him by God. God's promises of God's plans. Joseph is, uh, Joseph, uh, sorry, God's dreams compounded an already unhealthy sibling rivalry and turned it into downright evil betrayal. And now Joseph, a teenage boy, sits as a slave in a godless foreign land. Consider with me all that he has lost. All freedom and personal autonomy. Now he will be told where to go and what to do and when to eat. He has lost all previous authority, privilege, and comfort. He is a nobody here. His value, his utility. He has lost all security, all plans, all hope for a future. Fear is in its place. The future is dark. 
And it is all beyond his control. He has lost all that is familiar, all that he has known, his family, his, younger, his youngest brother, Benjamin. The memory of his dead mother is wrapped up in Benny's face. Their pairing had a bond unlike any of the other siblings. And above it all, Joseph mourns the loss of his father, his voice, his strength, his nod of approval. And Joseph sits utterly alone, helpless. He is completely vulnerable. You know, he is ripe for resentment, self-pity, and bitterness. Isn't that how your story would go? Don't we expect to read next? And Joseph became embittered against the world and longed to just watch it burn. That he spurned Potiphar. He spurned his circumstances, and he spurned God. Isn't that your expectation? And yet we read the opposite. The opposite. Now keep in mind here that this narrative covers years. So there's plenty of room, (coughs) excuse me, there's plenty of room for hurt feelings, for moments of doubt and self-pity. But when you ask the question, how is it that Joseph did not become filled with resentment, self-pity, and bitterness? (coughs) How is it? Let's reread the text. The Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him. And how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight. And became his personal servant. And he made him overseer of his house. And all that he owned, he put in his charge. And it came about from that time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that the Lord had owned, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in his house and in his field. You see, the Lord was with Joseph. His presence never left. In fact, we should say that his presence drew near and became heightened. Joseph does not become embittered because God's presence and God's favor rested upon him, even as he is a slave in a foreign, godless land. Now, beloved, you need me to ask this in a probing fashion because it is our tendency when trial hits to ask, God, what happened? God, where are you? We equate that because there is a trial, God's presence has left us. So, We know that God was with Joseph in the dreams, right? That must have been awesome to get special revelation in a dream from the Lord. And this text here says that God was with Joseph while he was a slave in Egypt. So now let me ask you, was the Lord with Joseph when his brothers threw him in a pit? 
Did the favor of the Lord rest upon Joseph when they sold him? Even in their (coughs) evil intention, and even when Joseph did not feel the nearness of God, was the Lord still with Joseph? Yes. Yes. Even in their evil, God's hand of protection stayed. And God's plan of redemption was unfolding. The Bible demands that we look at this mess of a situation and remember that all the while, God's presence is with him. God's favor rests upon him. Now I know here in Genesis 39, we just get the final answer. Years are covered, and you just get the final answer. It's God's presence that kept Joseph from becoming bitter. But the Psalms are a help to us here, okay? As we wrestle with the messiness of life, and finding God's presence, and waiting for God, and believing God's presence is still there, even when you can't feel it. So quickly, like I I wanna survey Psalm 27. Look at Psalm 27 with me, because it starts out (coughs) with with one of the most quoted, climactic uh, verses in the whole of scripture. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? But look at verses two and three because we see the situation. When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh, though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. So you get the situation, right? He is surrounded by his enemies. But now listen for the way that David searches for God's presence. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face. My heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. Do you hear him wrestling with God? Then verse 13, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. See, he believes. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. (coughs) So we see from the Psalms and from David, right? We are called to fight for God's presence. We are called to seek him and to wait for him. To believe that even against circumstances, we will see the goodness of the Lord. Now, I say all of that because some of you are here today and you are going through some stuff. Amen? You are going through some stuff. And you identify with Joseph's story. That there are enemies coming against you that there are circumstances that do not make sense at all. And this morning, you need to say, all right, God, I give you permission to use even this for my good. And God, your presence is the only thing that's gonna keep me from becoming bitter and wallowing in self-pity. God, I need you. All right, so catch the scene with Joseph. 
He goes to Egypt a slave, the very bottom of the social ladder. But the presence of the Lord is with him. And God's favor rests upon him. You see, Joseph doesn't become an embittered victim. Instead, he chooses to become a valuable asset to Potiphar's house. Suddenly, he's an example of a loyal servant who works hard, is obedient, diligent, reliable, trustworthy. And all that Joseph does in his work, he does it as worship unto the Lord. And God blesses. And the favor of the Lord rests upon him. Because Joseph chooses to become a blessing. Now grasp this, Joseph carries the impressions of the Lord with him wherever he goes. He is salt and light, as Matthew 5 says. And Joseph says, they can't make me bitter because I've got the presence of the Lord with me. Because I am blessed and I am highly favored. My circuit, they can't make me bitter. And Potiphar can see the favor of the Lord upon his life. Now, I wonder if you know the favor of the Lord on your life. I wonder if your work knows that regardless of your position, that the favor of God rests upon you. I wonder if you view every task as a way to worship God to shine his light and to show his favor. Now we need to move quickly through this next portion of the story. It's a part that many of us are familiar with and that is how Potiphar's wife lusts after Joseph and tries to get her, him to sleep with her. Now this could be a, a sermon on its own We don't have time for that. But for our purposes today, what you need to know is that even though the presence of God was with Joseph and the favor of God rested upon him, that did not mean that evil did not come looking for him. You hear me? God's presence did not mean that the trial of the circumstances that he found himself in nor the temptation that came looking for him. You understand? Beloved, this is fundamental because we so often associate God's favor with absence of trial or temptation, right? When everything is easy, you say, oh, God has blessed me now. Everything's easy. That's not what the text says. So in verses 6 through 18, we find out that Joseph is young, he is handsome, he is in the prime of his life, and Potiphar's wife desires him. Now, we are not told the details of her marriage, whether Potiphar was a good husband or a bad husband, whether they were soulmates or not, because that doesn't matter at all. She desires a sexual relationship that is outside of scriptural bounds. And Joseph's response is textbook for how the Bible says you and I are to handle sexual temptation. And for the record, the Bible actually has a lot to say about this. It's very common that you can be reading in the New Testament a letter from Paul and he tells you to lift your eyes to all that you have in Christ Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus. And then the moment that he starts to say to us how we are to walk in obedience to the Lord, he addresses sexual sin. Very common. So don't be surprised by this. 
In verses eight and nine, we are told Joseph's reply to Potiphar's wife's advances. First, (coughs) Joseph begins with loyalty to Potiphar. Joseph actually cares about Potiphar's trust. Right, Joseph has shown character. Joseph has worked hard. He has earned trust, and it matters to him. His name and his reputation are on the line, and he considers that more important than his own desires. But secondly, in verse 9, Joseph says, how can I do this great evil and sin against God? You see, Joseph understands that every sin separates you from God. It breaks fellowship and mutes God's anointing presence in your life. That every sin is first and foremost against God. As David would later say in Psalm 51, after he had slept with Bathsheba and killed Uriah, God against you and you alone have I sinned. If we're following along, we can see that the key to temptation is in verse 10. Look at verse 10. As she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. So picture the scene. (coughs) Because he's already told her no. But you know what she said to him? Hey, Joseph, what if we just lie down and talk? I could tell you what I've been reading and what shows I've been watching. I could just kind of, we just talk. Maybe we could rub each other's feet or something. Let's just lie side by side. What's the harm in that? What's the harm in that? Because you're just playing around. You're just pretending to be harmless when you very well know that step one leads to step two. And so Joseph put guardrails in place. Says he was mindful to avoid her presence as much as he intentionally could. Now, beloved, many of us in this room need to quit playing with fire, with half-hearted efforts to avoid sexual sin. Because you are muting God's anointing presence on your life because you refuse to get serious about avoiding sexual sin. So verse 11, we are told that Potiphar's wife sets a trap for Joseph. She gets everyone out of the house. All right, she makes sure they all go to lunch at the same time. And she gets Joseph alone. Look at verse 12. And she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. He didn't exchange pleasantries. He didn't try and reason with her. He fled. Do you know what the Bible tells you to do in the face of sexual temptation? Flee. Okay? Again, no reason. Don't get in a holy frame of mind and just kind of rise above the situation. You can handle it. You're tough. You're strong. No. Absolutely not. Flee. That's what the Bible says. Flee. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such that is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, what will God do? He will provide the way of escape. That is for you to flee. Not sit around. Rise above it, flee, so that you will be able to endure it. Beloved, sin is always a choice. And God has promised, God is faithful 
to give you the ability to flee. And so in the end, she is left holding his garment, lying on the bed, humiliated. And so she makes up the story that he tried to rape her. And then she tells that to her husband when he gets home. Now in verse 19, all we are told is that Potiphar is angered, but not at who? Now one would assume, well, he's angered at Joseph, except certainly this crime is punishable by execution. And Potiphar is a very powerful man. He's the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard. But Joseph's life is spared. And he's placed in a prison that happens to be unique to Pharaoh. And so Joseph has gone from favored servant of Pharaoh, head over all of his affairs and home, to now a nine by nine cold cell. You say, but Joseph was righteous. He resisted. He did all that God required of him. Pastor, you said the favor of God was upon his life and that God was with him. And so the author reminds us again. Look at verse 21. But the Lord (coughs) was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done in there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Beloved, God is at work. God has protected Joseph's life from death twice now. Evil came, but God said, not that far. And because we know the story, we know that God has strategically moved Joseph into close proximity to Pharaoh. That God's hand is moving. And that the plan of redemption is unfolding. Joseph may look knocked down, but the story isn't over yet. But listen to me. Even above God's protection, and even above God's providential plan, what this text highlights is that even in trial and in temptation, that the presence and favor of God rested upon Joseph's life. That Joseph is blessed. Now what do I mean when I keep saying that the favor of God rested upon Joseph's life? I mean that God was intentionally for Joseph working on his behalf for his good. That God had chosen Joseph as his own. That God's name was attached to Joseph. That God is intentionally paying special attention to Joseph. (laughs) That he's giving special attention to Joseph's prayers. That God cares about Joseph's character as a father does for a son. And so God is disciplining and shaping through any and every circumstance his character. And also that God delighted to give Joseph wisdom and prosperity and success and good gifts as a sign of his presence. All of that is what the text means when it says that God's presence and God's 
favor is upon Joseph's life. And so now I ask you, believer, do you believe that the presence of God and the favor of God rest upon your life in the same way? Right, do you read this account like we so often do when when we're reading our Bibles and we think, man, I wish I was Joseph. Believer, will you allow me to contend with your unbelief? You are in Christ. You are in In the Son. His blood is upon you. He has covered you with his righteousness. So that the Spirit of God may permanently indwell you. That is why he came. So that you are now the temple of the holy God. Joseph longs for your favor. Okay? And Christ didn't just save you from your sin. Christ came to give you his favor. So that his favor now rests upon you. That he calls you his own. That his name is upon you. That he has chosen you from eternity past. That he hears your prayers. That he even intercedes for you when you don't know how to pray. That he gives special attention to your affairs. He is mindful of you. That he leads you. And he disciplines you as a son or a daughter, as his own, because he delights in you. He delights to shape you. And he delights to give you wisdom and success and good things. He delights for his favor to be upon you. If you are in Christ, You are in the favor of God. And he rests upon your life. Beloved, all that Joseph has is yours and more. Right? And if you are not functioning in the favor of God, then you do not understand who you are. Or you are muting God's presence because of sin. So again, I ask you, believer, do you walk in the presence and in the favor of God? Does it rest upon your life? Do you carry the impressions of Christ everywhere that you go? Or do you walk around as if you are some redheaded stepchild who drew the short end of the straw that God does not know? Beloved, this morning I call you forward to believe the word of God. This is why his son came. So that you would be blessed and highly favored. So that you would know that he hears you. He's mindful of you. He calls you his own. He's Completely satisfied in the Son. Completely satisfied in the Son on your behalf so that He calls you His own. And you are in the favor of Christ. Oh, I pray that you know that. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, oh, that we can call you Father. There is no one like you. Though we have sinned, you have pursued us. Though we have sinned, you have given your one and only son. That we would know you. That our sin could be atoned for and paid. 
and that we could walk in your favor and in your blessing, even through trial, even through temptation, that you are our Father. I pray all across this room that believers in Christ would know that and would would walk in that. Father, if there are here, some here this morning that are not in you, that they would realize why they do not have your favor, that they would realize that their sin separates, and that they would hear the call to come and be in Christ, to believe in Christ, and that they would have eternal life. King Jesus, you came so that we would have life and have it to the full. I pray to that end this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Beloved, as the praise team comes to lead us in a final song, you are invited to respond. You are commanded to respond to God's word. I can't tell you what that looks like, but listen to me. In your heart of hearts, If you've heard the Spirit of God, respond to Him. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you want to use these steps or stage as an altar to pour out your heart before the Lord, to respond to what He has said to you, please, just be obedient. Just be obedient. Would you stand?